Right. Um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to see so many um, colleagues in, in one room. What I will be talking about today is um, data science and AI for public good and some experience from cross-sectoral collaboration because that's all what we're doing quite often and this is a large part of what I do is trying to work around collaboration within universities, so academia, public sector and private sector. My day job is a chief scientific advisor to Essex County Council which allows me to work on this cross-sectoral collaboration trying to boost it. What I will be talking today is just a brief intro about what is cross-sectoral collaboration and why we're doing that. And then I'll talk through three small cases. One case is essentially thinking about the Catalyst project. I will introduce the Catalyst project as a first case of cross-sectoral cooperation. Then an example from abroad, California Policy Lab, and some of the lessons that we can learn from California Policy Lab. And finally is the new thing that we're starting in Essex, and this is the Essex Center for Data Analytics, uh, bringing together analytic capability, data science capability from County Council, Essex County Council, University of Essex, and Essex Police. Cross-sectoral partnerships. So why do we care about cross-sectoral partnerships? And we can think about just one single drive that happened over the last year, and this is the industrial strategy, and specifically the AI sector deal. With the AI sector deal, there's a specific um, incentive for this trilateral cooperation, cross-sectoral cooperation. <coughs> it's private sector, public sector, and universities, academia. AI sector deal is there designed to attract and retain talent in academia, uh, in UK, with the ambition that UK should be the world's most innovative economy. And this is particularly important with Brexit coming up. So I used the word Brexit um, quite early in the talk. So at attract and retain talent. And now that uh, Europeans will not be able to jump the queue, we'll get all the best international talent coming to the UK. We'll improve digital infrastructure, which is really important if we want to get um, frictionless trade and technical solutions to frictionless trade on the Irish border. And crucially, it's the prosperity of society through AI. And this is what a lot of this work that we're trying to do is bringing data science and AI, um, trying to improve prosperity of society. And that may be caring for vulnerable people. And this is a huge chunk of work that is being done. And it can be um, just working on local economic growth and any other aspect of local government. So just to say that cross uh, sexual collaboration within the AI sector deal, it has money attached to it. And it's one billion pounds that came in from just the sector deal which again taps with a 1.7 billion from industrial uh, strategy challenge fund. So it's 2.7 billion pounds roughly that you can tap into if you want to work around data science and AI and specifically in the area of this cutting edge development with cross-sectoral, with local government, central government, industry and private sector and universities. So as a first example, as a first case, let me introduce the Catalyst. And just to say that Catalyst uh, has a stand, Catalyst project has a stand outside. So during the coffee break, take a look at the Catalyst project. It's a 2.2 million investment from Hefke with the university as an anchor investment, plus collaborative partners from Essex Police, uh, Essex County Council, Suffolk County Council, and several other organizations. And the idea is to help these organizations tackle issues that are wicked issues, so really difficult to deal with. Deal with them with the help of the university as an anchor institution. So we already have the leader of the council, so in the local government terms would be the Prime Minister of Essex. Leader of the council saying that it's great, the cooperation with the university allows Essex be at the forefront of dealing with the problems, the, these wicked issues. And it's at the forefront, and it's the ambition of Essex is to be ahead of other local authorities. So that's what Catalyst is doing. 
And just to say a shameless plug, there's a conference coming up in June, June 26. Um, tickets are being sold out uh, and you, you need to sign up if you want to attend the conference. But it's a great conference it's highlighting the work and it's the end of the project. And because it's the end of the project, we wanted to draw some lessons from the Catalyst. What can we learn from the Catalyst as this unique collaborative experience of two councils, two counties, plus our extra partners and the university? How easy was it to work between different councils? How easy was it for the university to be involved? So let me just give you a couple examples of um, how it started. And we, Catalyst had been going for a year and a half before I arrived. And when I arrived, we tried to boost the relationship with the councils. And because we have the academics and we have the council and a slightly different um, audience, right? So we tried to think about this as a two-pronged approach. First, we thought about boosting the relationship by looking at this from the academic perspective. We set up panels at the Data for Policy conference. And the idea was that we can attract academics working on projects around local government issues. We can bring them to this conference and they can present the work in a really academic setting. Uh, Data for Policy, if you don't know, is this um, it had three conferences so far. It's going to be the fourth one in June again, uh, 2019. But it's supposed to bring practitioners and academics together working around policy issues with data, so data science aspect of policy. So we set up a panel. We brought practitioners. The only downside was that academics were not really interested um, in presenting their work because it wasn't the right outlet for academics. And this is again is different fields and one of the lessons we learn is that what may work well for, for example, for computer science colleagues as a conference paper may not work well for social science colleagues who just treat, don't treat conferences the same way as a publication outlet as you would expect from um, computer science colleagues. So um, we thought that the approach from the academic perspective didn't really work so we'll try something else. And we developed um, what we call the challenge lab. Challenge Lab is a concept that you bring together academics, practitioners, and you work in a close environment uh, for two days with a dinner in between um, and drinks. And you work in close environment and you develop answers, projects around certain issues that are important for policymakers. So policymakers are the ones setting the agenda in terms of the issues. And you have academics who may be interested in working on these issues because data are available and there are lots of opportunities for research and also there's seed money attached. So we developed this package sponsored by the Catalyst and Impact Accelerator account from the university where we had seed money available, £10,000 per project um, for about six projects um, as a result of the Challenge Lab. We approached it where we, um, we, it, we took our time, so it took us about half a year to develop the Challenge Lab. What we've done first is we set a series of small workshops, small scale workshops within County Council, Essex County Council, trying to identify what are the key priorities that they have, what are the key issues that they're working on, and then based on that, develop agenda for the Challenge Lab. So it was in a way driven by the practitioners, but also we linked it up to the business plan. So the business plan. So you have the strategic plan, you have the business plan, and the business plan is something that County Council has to deliver within the next 12 months. So we tried to link it up to the business plan, something that has to be delivered anyway. They're committed to delivering this. So we wanted to link up projects to the business plan, thinking that that might help us get the buy-in from the practitioners. So um, on the day, it was quite a success. Uh, I don't have the pictures, unfortunately, but we had about 70 people about equally split between the academics and practitioners coming from County Council. We had one of the executive directors, so the second in command in the County Council showing up and endorsing the activity and all other directors also endorsing the activity. We had uh, projects from support for vulnerable people to local economic growth to uh, internal um, improvement of the operations of the council. We had um, about 35, 40 academics from different fields from humanities, social sciences, computer science and engineering. Um, we also had biology. So there was quite a lot of um, enthusiasm for the projects. So in the end, we funded six projects. And some of them were from using green space. 
So using the green space in the mental health aspect. So it's for elderly and people with mental health, uh, so vulnerable people, um, using the green spaces that are available in Essex, for example, to improve their well-being. And there's a project on that. There's a project on garbage collection. There's a project um, on community resilience. Quite a few different projects. And also there were a couple of projects internally for county council to work better where you would have, for example, one of the projects was looking at the social care data, looking at the notes, the social care notes, applying natural language processing and developing predictive models to improve internal processes in social care uh, stream, children and adult social care. So these were the projects that we um, fu funded on the day. And one of the projects was also about data sharing, because what we understood early on and what we anticipated is that to make any of these projects possible, we need to be able to make data available to the projects. And data is usually locked in in the county council. And county council people responsible, owners of the data, they were present on the day. So we made sure that the owners of the data or their delegates would be present on the day. This way they could sign in um, with the idea and sign off on the project. And um, there was a sp specific project on the data sharing. It was, in our view at the time, it was great success, right? Um, one tiny insignificant detail is that uh, a year down the line, a year and a half down the line, three of the projects still didn't get their data sharing agreements. Um, they're still um, working on data sharing agreements when the money will expire in December. So in, in a couple of days time, we'll have no money left in the projects that haven't even started because, and this is not only a county council. Um, one of the things that happened in the meantime was Cambridge Analytica. And then all of a sudden, uh, our internal ethics review in the university decided to review anything that has to do with data. So it slowed down with some ethics approvals going for half a year because it's just the whole challenge of what do you do? Uh, how do you do an ethics review? Um, university wasn't really equipped to deal with that. Uh, and because there was an escalation, lots of projects going through, there was a delay on the university side, there was a delay on the data sharing, with all the owners of the data signing up, there was another tiny thing that happened in between, is the GDPR was coming into force quite soon, right? So the data governance people in the county council, they were busy with GDPR implementation. And this was, Challenge Lab was unfortunately a bit further down the list uh, of their priorities compared with compliance with the, with the law. Um, so, just to say that we felt that at the time we felt it would be an ingenious solution to all the problems that we face and we will unlock this great cooperation, something that we were unable to do with a conference approach, the standard academic approach, we would do with this challenge live approach. Uh, we were a bit disappointed obviously that it took us such a long time to start some of the projects. Um, one of the projects is another example that is using public data. So you don't need to have any uh, approvals, you don't need to have uh, any data governance uh, compliance and regulation to be involved. Um, that project on the community resilience, it is started, it worked well, but then the whole team from County Council that was working on the project um, essentially disappeared overnight. And that's another unfortunate thing that happened is the restructuring at the county council. So the academic was left there without the team from county council, uh, but he finished the project and he, the paper is now published in a computer science journal. So it's, in a way, from the academic point of view, it's a success story, right? We got a deliverable out, but maybe not as much as we could have done. So all kinds of things might happen, and in this case they happened, that led this critical issue of Challenge Lab not being as successful as we wanted. Uh, but just to give you a slightly different spin, we're not the only ones. So this is the challenge.gov. I don't know whether you know the challenge.gov. This is open um, innovation initiative. It's the same idea that you have in US. US government, uh, there's a portal where different parts of US government can sponsor an issue. There's some money attached and you have crowdsourcing of ideas. Citizens can submit their ideas and they can do whatever they want, any ideas to any problems. And that can be from how do you deal with families with opioid epidemic to um, can you come up with a more creative way to um, utilize, destroy chemical weapons from obviously from Pentagon uh, project to all kinds of other things. So challenge.gov started in 2010. 
and it spent 250 million on 1,000 projects. It seems like a success. There was a tiny <laughs> fly in the open that in 2018 there was an academic paper published in Journal of Public Management where they looked at this case study of challenge.gov and it's not as successful as it may seem. If you purely look at the number of money spent and the projects that went through, usually the problems that they face is that there's no need for a lot of these projects. So there's a high level buy-in to be in open innovation, but the middle and lower ranking management doesn't really care about involving crowdsourcing solutions. So a solution can be chosen. There would be citizen feedback as a solution to a problem, but there will be no implementation. So the money would be spent, but none of the solutions would be implemented. And this is quite endemic for the challenge.gov that a lot of the solutions suggested have not been implemented because there was not enough buy-in from middle and lower ranking management in the organization's agencies that submitted uh, these problems. So similar issues that we had, data, data access, IP, and all sensitivity of data, all the issues that we faced are exactly the same issues that challenge.gov with vastly more resources face. So it just um, felt us, uh, we felt a bit better that we're not the only ones. Um, and our solution, our idea, as good as it was, it's not the only one that failed, right? To unlock, to boost the partnership. Okay, so we moved on trying to think, what can we learn from this? So again, apologies for the messed up slides. What we learned is that, um, let's ask the stakeholders. One of the things we can do, we can easily ask all the people involved, what are the key issues that they're concerned about? And the concern that they have was um, essentially locked in. So we use the catalyst, this collaborative uh, project between Suffolk County Council, Essex County Council and the police, and we ask people involved in the project. And we ask them around three things. First is the challenges to knowledge transfer, challenges to co co cooperation between different partners, and also leadership challenges. Is there anything within these areas that stops collaboration or hinders collaboration? We've done the interviews and um, this is just a brief word cloud from the transcript of the interviews. It's 35,000 words. People told us a lot about the things. But one of the things you can think, you can see is that data features quite prominently uh, within this project. Data sharing, data issues around data sharing, they feature quite prominently. And again, this is not new. You all know that, and I, I'm sure that you all face the same issue. But it seems like there hasn't been a solution yet. So what we, when we try to analyze the answers in our interviews, we thought that we can distill them, digest them to core things, core lessons. So challenges to knowledge transfer, we identify them as uh, weak personal connections. So it's within the parentheses 10 is the number of people who suggested that this is an issue, the number of interviews that suggested that this is an issue. Weak personal connections. So the, that seems like it's an obvious issue and we need to have some, some kind of bracing this device between the two organizations or three organizations in this case, how do you bring them together, improve the personal connections, we are not the only ones who talked about it. There's a huge literature on collaboration in public management that talks about it. So there's a, I just threw in a couple citations from the literature where these topics have been discussed in a lot of detail. So we are not encountering something new. This has been encountered before. People talked about this during the collaboration, in the collaboration literature. We know that there are weak personal connections. We know that there's lack of social cohesion. So lack of social cohesion, there have been some suggestions again from the literature and case studies that people done around the world, bring people together for coffees or to watch sports together. I guess in England case, bringing people together to watch uh, Premier League might be inciting conflict rather than trying to create social connections. But there are all the solutions that are available and they have been discussed and implemented a lot multiple conflicting priorities. So you would try to streamline the priorities of the partnership so that 
two organizations are not working towards different priorities. Risk aversion, you try to empower people to think about trying new things is not destined to failure, it's just lessons to be learned and you allow people to experiment. And again, this has been done before on their case studies and has been done for decades. So quite a few of these citations, they're just the core things in the literature. So challenges to cooperation, similar, communication. Organizations are not talking to each other. They're different people in different organizations responsible for communication. Linking up correct people. When you have a project and you have a, you're trying to find an academic, you're trying to link up correct people. Lack of shared uh, collaborative reality. Institutional forces, so different parts of the, for example, different parts of the university don't compete against each other in trying to get a contract or a commissioned research project with a public sector organization. So flexible adjustments. You start on the projects and there's not enough flexibility within your, whatever the name would be, research and enterprise office to change them on the fly as reality changes. So there are all kinds of things that we encounter that also they are known in the literature and we've known this for a long time from collaboration uh, research. Management. Um, there are a lot of things within the management and the key thing within the management that a lot of people mentioned is lack of facilitative leadership. Leadership that is available is not allowing, is not facilitating uh, to explore new things and it's not facilitating collaboration between the organizations. There's also a misalignment of objectives and we know that because we work in an area where we need to publish, as academics we need to publish, that might not be the same uh, priority for public sector organization. And just to re-emphasize, we know that because there's a lot of research on that and we know the determinants of success and failure. What one crucial thing is that knowing the determinants of success and failure doesn't help us get any new collaboration successful. We usually end up within the same, with the same mistakes and with the same um, failures. And it's like this cycle, we keep on repeating the same thing. So let me just give you another example, a slightly different case. And this is from California Policy Lab. California Policy Lab, if you don't know, it's a collaborative unit set up between Berkeley, UCLA, and the wider University of California system, and uh, California government. And this is different agencies within, broadly speaking, California government. It's bringing together, similar to what we talked about the challenge line, right? Bringing together policy issues, wicked problems, and academics, and matching them up to academics with Berkeley, from Berkeley or UCLA, and trying to come up with solutions. And they had some successes. Almost immediately as they started, they've done an evaluation work of uh, prison system. So it's the contraband, smuggling drugs in prisons. There was an expensive policy that was put forward by the California government, and a simple evaluation work about the impact evaluation, whether it was successful or not, allowed to say that it, it was an utter failure as a policy. And cancelling the policy immediately after this evaluation saved 15 million pounds from the project. A different scale, right? So in California, one of the biggest economies. Um, but it shows that it can be done. And there are also some lessons from that. And you can see that these are the main barriers for academics and for civil servants. And these main barriers are really similar to what we encounter in our world. <coughs> So lack of access to data, it's the same barrier that they encounter in um, California Policy Lab. Communication challenges, questions not being aligned, questions asked in research not being aligned to questions that actually civil servants care about or policymakers care about. Publish and perish mentality in academia, completely is not aligned uh, and it hinders work on this cases that don't lead to publication, clear publication, clear academic publication. Main barriers to civil servants is data silos, lack of capacity and time, changes in leadership and strategy, and again this is something that we encounter all the time, political pressure and rapid pace of decision making. It could take us a year to come up with excellent best research possible, but in this, uh, in this time civil servants lose any interest in the project because they moved on. They just had a they had to find a good enough solution. Not the best solution, not the most excellent research, but good enough research, good enough solution, because the pace of decision making is slightly different than what we encounter. And this difference of priorities and difference of barriers, heterogeneity at CPL,
California Policy Lab, they came up with a solution that they call it Fuse Unity Through Diversity. What they've done is they, create, they brought people in from civil service and from academia to set up and mingle within the lab. So the director of the lab will be from academia, but the deputy director will be from civil service. And together they will be working and there will be a board that is mixed up uh, from civil service and from academia, from policymakers and academia. And through this mix of priorities, they're trying to work through the barriers by bringing people together. Another thing is that they have a clear set up uh, key standards, the governance standards. So you start with identifying uh, the priority, connect government and academic. Then you move to develop research agenda through potential solutions. And then crucially, before you go any further, you would set up data sharing protocols, MOUs. So data sharing again becomes the crucial step, but even before it develops into a concrete project, you will have this done. So it's effective creation of data pairing, uh, sharing solutions, ensuring data confidentiality and pairing government agencies with appropriate academics. So these are the governance standards in CPL. So let me tell you what we're trying to learn from that. Uh, from all this experience, we're trying to learn within a project that uh, the title is Essex Center for Data Analytics, ECDA. This is a project that brings together three partners. Essex Police, Essex County Council, and University of Essex. And this is the, we're trying to learn a lot from the literature, from previous experiences, international experiences, other experiences in the UK. And we're trying to develop what the vision is, the best data analytic capability in the UK. So this is the vision, again. Okay. So the vision is that to make Essex national leaders using the power of data science and AI to tackle public policy challenges. And it's bringing together the aims of the project to make Essex a place that is the exemplar for the integration of data across public bodies. So we're trying to put this as a forefront, integrating data, bringing data together from different public bodies, from county council, from police, bringing together the skills from the university. But the core thing is that the data sharing, that is the biggest problem, we're trying to deal with it as a first step, trying to put this at, at the forefront. Have skills, capability, and technology to undertake predictive uh, analysis, predictive modeling, based on ethical and high standards. So ethics underpins everything, and I will mention in a sec again. We want to have sustainable data infrastructure, something that is not a short-term solution, something that can be sustainable over the long term, with the data sharing, so the platform, whether it's cloud-based, whether it's premises-based, it needs to be sustainable. So it doesn't depend on specifically one budget cycle where the money is available and then when the money runs out, the project fails. So we want to have a sustainable solution that allows us to work through longer term. And have the best data science analytics capability in UK to benefit the people and the community of Essex. So that's the aims and that's the project. So let me just briefly talk what we've done so far. So that's the pipeline of the project. We are in phase two. Phase one was learning about capabilities within the three partners. What have we done? How are we moving forward? We've done this self-assessment. I will mention in a sec. We moved on. We analyzed what's, what's been done in UK, the best practice in UK, best practice outside of UK. We learned from that and we tried to implement it in the next phase. So currently in phase two, we are in phase two. What we are doing now is we are setting up an ethics board, independent ethics review board that will be reviewing all the work that is going through um, on the ethics and data governance. We, are, um, we identify the uh, gaps in our capabilities. We are developing the stream of training to, to fill those gaps and identify partners who can be also used, um, bring them in into the, um, into the solution. And once we go through that, we are slowly moving to the model business case, return on investment, and then we go live. We have a pipeline of projects that we want to implement. And finally, we want to bring benefit to the community. So that's where we are. We are really quite early in the journey, but we've done a lot already. 
And one of the things that we do have based on our self-assessment is that we have high, um, highly skilled workforce and we have a leadership buy-in. So we have the top leaders who are the sponsors of the project. So the chief executive of Essex County Council is one of the sponsors. Chief Constable of Essex Police is the second sponsor and University Vice Chancellor Anthony Forster is the third sponsor of the project. They are the ones that form the sponsors team. So we have the high level buy-in, the highest level possible in Essex. And we have their capability spread out. We have their, board, their governing board. We have a lot of buy-in from the directors and the executive directors level. We have people from three institutions involved in the project. We want to be better at sustainability and we identify this as a thing that we're working on to make this project more sustainable. We want to talk to citizens and hear citizens' voice, their concerns, and bring it in. So the feedback from citizens will be brought in into the development of ACTA. We want to develop infrastructure, as I said, about that is sustainable. But there are lots of opportunities. And I will mention a sec the opportunities. We are also we are working in this space. And um, yeah, we're learning a lot as well as we work. But in terms of, this is the current projects, and I have a colleague, Stephen Simkin from Essex County Council, who will be on a panel a bit later. And you can ask him questions if you want about specifics of the projects. Um, but there are all kinds of projects that are already going on within the Essex data space. is the gang violence, domestic abuse, um, school readiness. We have other projects that are going on that are being set up. So it's, for example, implementation of AI within the mental health stream. So one of the projects of this broader Essex partners is that we want to help people on the front lines who are dealing with mental health presentations. We want to help them with the guidelines, how to deal with that. Quite often, you have mental health presentations that don't happen at your local GPs or the hospital. Um, there's a, some statistic that shows that a lot of times people with mental health presentations see a person in uniform and will just approach the person in uniform with a mental health presentation. And police officers are not always equipped. They're not trained to deal with that. So we want to develop guidelines. It could be a librarian. We want to develop guidelines that will help guide um, using the Health Education England, developing these guidelines and uh, working on solutions like that. So there's the roadmap and there are quite a few different projects that are in the roadmap, different stages of development. And this pipeline of project is something that we are taking through. These are the opportunities and the two opportunities that I would like to draw attention to is the risk certification, so it's predictive modeling, and another one is natural language processing, um, where we bring the expertise from computational linguistics, computer science, and we try to extract additional information from unstructured data text, for example, social care notes, and we build it into the pipeline that allows us to learn something, get, generate insights. So as an example, the NLP in policy, it's not uh, something crazy and hasn't been done before. This is an example from Cabinet Office report that showed that you can use um, case notes, apply natural language processing, generate topics from text, and then plug those topics, the general topics that appear, plug them into the predictive model, machine learning model, and this way you will be able to predict whether a specific case gets re referred to the system or gets escalated. So it's been done already and implemented and we want to develop, build on this capability in Essex in ACTA. Another example is risk certification and these are the two projects that you may have heard of and I will tell you in a sec why. So Hackney and Tharok uh, councils, they used a company, a tech company Accenture to develop a predictive model, identify vulnerable families. Another one is Brent Council. They, they work together with IBM to develop a risk model to identify children um, in risk of criminal exploitation. So these two projects, they're already going on and they are um, in place. But you may have heard of these projects uh, from the two Guardian articles, and I think there was a Daily Mail article as well that covered that, that uh, said that essentially councils use well, the, the first headline, councils use 377,000 people's data in efforts to predict child abuse. The follow-up article with a headline, data on thousands of children used to predict risk of gang exploitation. So by themselves, the articles were not overly critical, but they 
from this you cannot see, but there was another article that used the minority report um, fragment from the film. So the articles uh, imply there's the whole minority report that is going on and it might be dangerous. And they not necessarily fully accurately represented the governance procedures that are in place. Pseudonymization, data access, all the issues that councils thought about, they were not really spelled out in the article in The Guardian, and I, understandably because it's quite short, but it created this illusion that there's complete anarchy going on and data being exploited and children um, are at risk of their data being stolen. So all these things were could have been read from uh, the report and um, you can ask my colleague from County Council how many freedom of information requests they received immediately after the articles. But these are the things that come up and if we're not fully transparent and open with the ethical, clear ethical guidelines, we can end up with this misinformation, mis representation of, um, of the result that we're doing. So that's why within ACTA we're developing ESSEX standards. ESSEX standards very roughly is openness, transparency and ethics. They underpin every aspect of ACTA work. So that becomes crucial and that's why we're not going, we are now at the stage of creating the ethics board, ethics review board, and we're not going with the projects until we set it up or until we have a stopgap solution going through university ethics review board. But every project that we do will have this ethical review and it will be open and transparent. So that's about as much as I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. In some examples, and this is again, it's not only collaboration literature in public management, it's, it's huge. And people have worked on this for a long time. It's not purely about data collaboration or data science aspects of collaboration, it can be anything. So there are examples, um, pharmaceutical or any other industry, right? And it depends, in, in some cases it's the middle management, in some cases it's the bottom management, um, where you seem to have the hinder to collaboration. In our case, um, you're probably all right, it's more middle management. I'm trying to be really careful. Um, it's probably middle management, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring them in. And it takes time. And colleagues at the County Council, they've done a wonderful job bringing, bringing people in. Not only middle management, but also high ranking executive director type, converting them, bringing them to the dark side, if you like. Um, so there's a lot of... Um, alignment of interests that is happening and you can think that in UK this is partly because councils face they need to do more with less as a standard phrase is they need to deliver public services with less resources so there's a, a bit of desperation there to think about technological solutions um, so there's a change in mentality around that but also a lot of this is just seeing how the things are changing and also initial initial perspective that um, technology is threatening and there are all kinds of things that can go wrong and then trying to explain that things, the governance procedures are in place, security procedures are in place and it doesn't need to go wrong. There are actually more opportunities there. So it's slow. That's the really quick answer is that it's slow but it's happening. Other questions? Um, so I've worked in uh, central government data acquisitions for Office of National Statistics for two years and I've just moved over to the Admin Data Research Partnership. So I'm feeling your pain on data sharing. Um, it doesn't matter how big your organization is, it's slow and hard and difficult. Um, one thing I was really interested in is you're talking about in the, uh, with the Essex Center for Data Analytics is around data storage because um, that's something that we that we at ONS have to manage as well is having one, a platform that can manage potentially massive data sets, but also something that's accredited for secure and secure enough to actually hold um, identifiable data, but also links identifiable data where you have large 
large and like you link bigger and bigger data sets together and you have more and more information about a single individual. Um, so I just wonder if you could like give any thoughts or where you are currently on actually that kind of infrastructure and, and what your plan is. Thanks. So I can, um, I can defer some of the questions for Stephen if you like to pick up some of it. But initially, we are at the early stages. We're exploring different solutions, what is available. We are at the stage of procurement that is not, not yet procurement started. So we are getting close to procurement. So we're exploring different opportunities. So we're talking to the big players like Amazon, Google, but we're also exploring what else is out there. And there's a lot of experience within, within Essex University uh, with the UK Data Archive that are accredited to hold uh, identifiable data, personal, personal identifiable data. So that lots of experience, decades of experience from that, that we were tapping into. And they're also currently working on a solution for one of the research councils on smart meter data. Uh, that is building um, open source, essentially open source architecture for secure storage and access of identifiable data. So this should be done and uh, delivered, I think, within the next year. So there are lots of lessons we can learn from that. And also one of the things that I think there was a decision made at some point that <clears throat> whatever the technological solution for data, data storage and data sharing, we want to have analytical capability that is flexible enough to work within different partners. University, if we think about computer science uh, and people working from computer science, they predominantly will use Python, for example, to access, but that may not be the technological solution that is available for county council or police, where they may be working with R or any other software. Right? So we want to have the analytical layer that is flexible enough to accommodate different partners. And we're also thinking down the line, it's not limited to three partners, uh, it's just this currently, that's the three partners. We're talking to NHS and talking to other organizations within Essex to increase the number of partners involved. So we need to be flexible enough. So whatever the technical solution for the storage, we want to have a flexible solution for the analytical layer. And it's really early days, but there's lots of experience and we've done exploratory talks with Amazon already and we talked to Google uh, Stephen, if there's anything you want to pick up on that. Um, not so much to add really, but I guess the, the projects to date. We've done on a kind of ad hoc basis, so our kind of joining and sharing, um, we've made the decision not to kind of re-identify and everything's been kind of tied together through a pseudonymization process. But longer term, I think this kind of dream of having shared care records across the health and social care sector. Um, it's good to have from a strategic position to look at these kind of big um, analytical pieces, but I, I think they will live or die by whether or not they will be able to kind of identify patients and kind of deliver kind of um, bespoke um, services to their needs. So it, it's coming in 2019, hopefully. Um, but I, I, I think our, the stage of the process we're at it's very much kind of uh, ad hoc, one by one, kind of taking each project as it comes. And so far, we haven't kind of looked at that re-identification process. Hi. Um, yeah, you talked about the importance of involving an ethics review and making that core central part. How much of what you need to do is also around sort of like public engagement, uh, a strategy around preparing the citizens of Essex um, for you being the world leader and using their data in this way? Yes, certainly citizens should know that we are the world leaders, right? Um, this is one of the things that we need to tell them. Um, but we, th there's a strategy, part of the pipeline of work that we're doing is involving citizens. We will have exploratory workshops with citizens, bringing them together, explaining what is being done. There will be a developed comm strategy first, explaining what is being done, but also it's bringing the feedback from citizens. So exactly whether it will be just workshops in different parts of Essex or whether there will be anything else, we are still not there yet at this stage, but there definitely will be um, a setup of talking to citizens, explaining what has been done, and clearly explaining that it's for improvement of public service delivery, and it's for the public benefit, rather than just some curiosity case for academics to be involved in, or county council, or big brother, um, or minority report, any of this stuff, right? So it's, this is part of the strategy, and we will be developing the exact bits and pieces of the strategy in the coming months. But it, it's definitely there, yeah. Are there any other questions?
to what extent do you think it's possible for the local government level to take these initiatives without the involvement or perhaps even the interest of central government? So th there's also the possibility that a local government is taking it forward without the interest of bringing a university in, right? That's also possible. So a university is not an indispensable partner in that. Uh, we have an example from one of the councils um, just up north from the university without naming the council that is not using the university as a partner for the Office for Data Analytics um, because they, they felt that there's no need to bring the university in. They have sufficient internal capability to deliver that. So I guess the same with the central government. Um, when we talk about this to central government people, so we had people from cabinet office visiting the university, they all get really excited because they, they, it's a great initiative and it helps. Hopefully technological solution will, um, council will ask for less money <laughs> from central government. Or uh, we'll stop complaining about lack of money. So there are all kinds of things. So I guess it's definitely possible. We are not, in any of these projects, we are not asking anything directly from central government. So it is possible to take it forward with our central government. Talking to the people in the data governance team at county council, they, their take on GDPR is that finally there's a legal framework that they can work with. And within this legal framework, there are all kinds of things we can do legally. And they now have clarity, so they don't need to ask permission or ask clarifications from ICO all the time. So in a way, we, we get into the stage that to deliver a lot of the projects that we have here, sorry, to deliver a lot of these projects, we don't need the central government, really. It can be done at the local government level because the target is the population of Essex. And that can be delivered, that's the data that we have, that's the responsibility of local authorities is on this level, and it can be done. There was one more question. Um, it, uh, it's a little bit uh, tied in with the previous question, but I'm sort of interested really in the practicalities of how this, the, the, um, uh, the, the sort of team at Essex County Council works. Is it looking at all those um, projects there on that map, is it that there are specialist analysts um, amongst different departments across the county council? Do, or do they come together or work as one group? Um, it was just a little bit around I the practicalities uh, of, of how um, it yeah. works. Hands out. So one of the things to say is that we have this senior leadership buy-in, right, that allows us to explore. So that's the senior leaders, the chief executive level that allows us to explore. Then there's the core delivery team that consists of representatives of three organizations, county council, police, and university. And this is the, the core delivery team. But then within the county council itself, um, there's quite a large pool of um, expertise and talent within the data analytics um, part of county council. They work with a, what you can call business side. So that can be people in social care, or place, so economic growth. And those projects will be sometimes originating from the business side, from social care, coming in. They are assessed. We are developing a specific approach how these projects will be defined, how they will be assessed, um, this pipeline assessment. So the projects that originate from the business side will be evaluated on certain criteria, feasibility, ethics, governance, and uh, whether we can deliver it at all. And that allows us to then pull capability. Down the line, what we're thinking is that ECDA, currently ECDA is just a virtual setup. We come for every meeting, we alternate. So we'll have a meeting at police headquarters, next meeting at county council, next meeting at the university. We alternate for the meetings when the core team and the sponsors meet, it alternates. Um, down the line, when we will have dedicated analysts working within team, data scientists working in the team, we will try to also alternate and bring them together so that they spend time in each other's organization. So analysts, data scientists from um, university will spend time with a county council data scientists working on projects and police data scientists and then moving to different organizations. This is one of the ways to build trust and break down some of the barriers that we face. Bringing people together seems to work um, from examples and other cases seems to work. So that's what we will try to do. So in practical sense, we have senior leadership buying, we have
core team that is already allocated, well, dedicated core team, and then it's building the clear pipeline, assessment pipeline of the projects that originate from business and bringing analysts together. Okay, so I think this brings this session to a close. Let's thank our keynote speaker one more time.